Hey, and welcome to futurethinkers.org, a podcast about the evolution of technology, society, and consciousness. I'm Mike Gilliland. And I'm Yuvia Ivanova. If you're new to the show and you want to get a list of our favorite books, popular episodes, and to join our community, go to futurethinkers.org slash start. Hey guys, and welcome to episode number 65 of the Future Thinkers podcast. Today, our guest is Dean Radin, the author of Real Magic. He is also the chief scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences and a professor at the California Institute of Integral Studies. We invited Dean on the show to share some of his findings from more than 40 years of research. So today we talk about how the esoteric and magic traditions overlap with modern studies of parapsychology and the mounting body of scientific evidence for what we think of as psychic phenomena. We also talk about how consciousness studies can be applied to science, technology, and real life. You can find all the show notes from this episode if you go to futurethinkers.org slash 65. Enjoy the show! This episode is brought to you by Qualia, a nootropic supplement that helps support mental performance and mood. To get 10% off, use the code FUTURE at checkout. And to learn more about neurohacking, visit futurethinkers.org slash neuro. So, Dean, uh, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Uh, we've been following your work for a long time. We just finished reading your new book. Um, and Real it's, Magic. Yeah, and it's a pleasure to um, to have you on the show so we can you know hear more about these subjects directly from you. So why don't we start? You can give a, us a bit of an intro of, of who you are and what you've been focusing on for the last couple of years. I suppose that uh, I've spent now the majority of my professional career studying consciousness and the capacities of consciousness. Uh, before that, I have a, a master's in electrical engineering and a PhD in psychology. I worked at places like Bell Laboratories and Princeton University and the University of Edinburgh. Uh, I spent a year on the formerly classified program called Stargate, which was the US government's uh, program of psychic espionage, which was, uh, we didn't know at the time for sure, but later we learned that Russia had a similar program. So we had uh, two competing programs on remote viewing at the same time. Now we know that. That's a perfect place to start. Okay, can you tell us about these programs? I think I mentioned that in the book. Yeah, I'm sure I did. So the, um, anytime you, you have a, uh, an organization, whether it's business or government or whatever, that is uh, charged with making decisions that uh, you don't have enough information to make a full decision, so you have to guess. So whenever you're forced with guessing, you want the, the best information that you can possibly get in an impossible way. Namely, you have to use your intuition, you're you're guessing, you hope that the guess is correct. So governments and businesses and wealthy people have always hired psychics who they hope will give them good information. Well, the US government has done that as well as most governments around the world, whether they admit it or not, or, or do have consultants with special skills. So a little bit uh, different than a consultant is a project that ran for about 20 years in in the US, uh, sponsored by the Defense Intelligence Agency and the CIA and a number of other agencies to have a more formalized way of providing uh, clairvoyance primarily for use in espionage. Uh, And there was a research side to the program, which I was part of. And then there was an operational side, which was hosted by the the US Army. And there were hundreds of operational missions where the remote viewers, remote viewing, by the way, is just a euphemism that was created for this program, but it really means clairvoyance. So the, these people were selected out of the ranks of the army uh, using questions that would filter out people who tended to be natural psychics, whether they knew it or not. And then they went through a training program which was developed by uh, the psychic Ingo Swan. He developed this program for the army. And while the, uh, the program persisted for 20 years because it was useful, provided useful information. 
it was it, it started roughly in 1972 and ended in 1995 at least it officially ended in 1995 when it was made public uh, and at that point from there to the next couple of years afterwards much of, of the program became declassified so there are plenty of books out there now that are written by former members of that program and by journalists uh, some of the information that you see in these books is correct and some of it is not completely correct. There are also portions of the history that will probably remain classified forever. And it's primarily about the individuals involved and the specifics of the missions that were, were involved. But among other things, you can say that we know that from laboratory studies that, the, uh, that remote viewing as an activity works you have high talented people, they can get real information from a distance in space or time. From an operational perspective, another way of doing the statistics on it, because you don't always know what the truth is in a given operational mission. We, it, the program would provide information that would be funneled in with lots of other intelligence information. And then somebody, an analyst would make sense of it all. So a little piece of the, of the information was, would be psychic some would be satellites, some would be humans on the ground and so on, they'd have to make a, a decision. But after hundreds of missions, you start to get statistics on how often a given agency would come back for more. So you figure if someone was asking for information and what they were getting from this program was useless, they're not gonna come back again. But there were a number of the agencies that came back dozens to hundreds of times. So it's a secondary way of showing that uh, that the information was useful for their missions, otherwise it wouldn't come back. And one of the most successful uses was drug interdiction. So these were people doing drug smuggling, coming in by boats or airplanes or whatever. And of course, the, the smugglers were, are very careful to try to avoid being detected when they're coming in. And yet the agencies tasked with finding them were using information from the remote viewers to successfully find them. And so they, they came back about 150 times for different missions. So they must have been doing something good. Wow. So what is actually involved in a remote viewing session? Well, the thing that makes that discriminates between a, a clairvoyant doing whatever they do and remote viewing is the, the protocol that was developed as a way of helping to structure what information is going to be received. So in the uh, remote viewing is always done blindly. So you, you can't give hints about the nature of the viewing to the viewer. Otherwise they, they call it front loading that you're gonna be primed to start fantasizing about it. So all that the remote viewer is told is typically something like a six digit random number. Now, the, the, somebody knows what that six-digit RAN number refers to, but the remote viewer and the interviewer, the person who is speaking to the remote viewer, neither of them can know anything about what that is. So it sounds already like an impossible task. I'll give you a six-digit number, and then you just start telling me about it. Somebody else knows that that refers to a specific target somewhere. Uh, so that was part of the protocol, to keep the viewers blind. And then you'd have the, the viewer who goes into this altered state to try to extract information from who knows where. You have an interviewer who acts as the analytical side of the conversation so that the viewer doesn't need to keep dipping in and out from an in intuitive side to a rational side. They can remain intuitive. Uh, the interviewer and the remote viewer will take audio recordings and sometimes a sketch of things that are coming to mind. Then all of that information is taken, given to a judge who has to figure out how to interpret it. And then somewhere further down the line uh, with multiple viewings from multiple people in multiple times viewing, all of that is in a package which is sent up the line to some other analyst who then figures in how do I interpret this given lots of other pieces of information. So the difference between what I just described and what is done in the laboratory, because that was an operational mission. In the laboratory, it stops with the judge. So the judge makes a decision, did the person get the target, which the judge knows, or did they not get the target? 
Hmm. Fascinating. I really like the term that was used in this book, analytical overlay, where people were trained to distinguish between information that comes up from the analytical mind and that comes up intuitively. And I think for for especially people in the modern world, we are trained to operate almost entirely with our analytical mind and dismiss anything that comes in intuitively. So the idea that you would want to shut off the analytical mind completely for extended periods of time just seems so preposterous to a lot of people. Um, not only preposterous, but very, very difficult to do. So we're, we're not encouraged to do that anywhere, right? If, you, if you're in school and, and you, the teacher sees that you're, uh, you're daydreaming, looks staring off into nothing, they immediately bring you back. You're not allowed to not be analytical. Yeah. In fact, this is one of the, the key aspects of training. If you go to a variety of places for uh, training as a residential program or online programs, most of the training is to get your analytical mind out of the way. It's to report what the raw experience is, your raw impressions, without trying to immediately name what the impression is. And most of the time we find that Somebody gets some kind of mental impression. They try to name it. They're, they're going off in the wrong direction. Yeah, right. As soon as you name it, you're done. It turns on the analytical mind and that link is broken. Right. Yeah. I really liked um, that in the book, you try to connect uh, the study of esotericism and, and uh, meditation and that sort of thing with the more modern research in parapsychology. And like you mentioned, that this link hasn't been made very much in recent times and that it's it's actually um, something that you realized also quite late in your career, that these two uh, different kind of fields were talking about the same thing. Can you talk about how you arrived at that conclusion? Well, I suppose part of me always knew that the, the esoteric ideas uh, are, are more compatible with psychic phenomena because I've spent my career studying psychic phenomena in the lab. Uh, we know that, but we also learn per early on to not talk about it. And for the same reason that, that a lot of people may have psychic experiences, but they also learn not to talk about it. And so we, we have a, uh, a taboo that prevents people from being open about their experiences. And not just psychic phenomena, there are all kinds of strange things that happen to people, uh, and it happened. So if it's, if it's not ordinary, then the moment you start telling other people about it, you can tell by their expression that they either don't want to hear about it or they think you're crazy. So this, this becomes a, a damper in terms of what can be discussed in public. So I, as a... Uh, as a traditionally trained scientist, I'm well aware of what is acceptable to talk about within the academic world. Uh, and yet at the same time, I can, I can describe this a little better by a study that we're, we're just about to publish. We did a survey among the general population and also among scientists and engineers to find out which kinds of psychic experiences that they've had. And most of these kinds of, of surveys are asking about beliefs. What, what do you believe? And we know that basically worldwide that the majority of the population believes in one or more psychic phenomena, but it doesn't, those surveys generally don't ask, well, why do you believe? So we were asking not about belief, but what have you actually experienced yourself? So we, we hired a company that gave us names of people uh, from the general population and also the subset of scientists and engineers who would answer surveys online. So the, the list was like a quarter of a million people or so. And of course, when you do an online survey anonymously out of the blue, you get a pretty small return rate, but we figured out how many we would need in order to get a valid survey. So we developed a list of 25 different kinds of experiences that people would call psychic. And then part of the survey was to say, which one of these 25 or more than one uh, have you ever experienced yourself? So among the general population, 
94% of the people said they had at least, at least experienced one of the 25. 94%. Wow. And on average, about seven of the 25 different kinds of, of phenomena. So this ranges from gut feelings and hunches, which may or may not be psychic, all the way up to clairvoyance and telepathy without using those terms. So we never use the term psychic anywhere in this. We simply describe experiences that people have. So then our, our main interest was what do you, what happens when you go to scientists who enge and engineers who are not taught about this stuff at all? And if, they're, if they learn anything about it in school, they learn that to dismiss it as superstition. 93% responded that they had personally experienced at least one of the 25 and on average eight of 25 experiences. So this is a way for us to confirm what we've already suspected that this is simply part of human experience. How you interpret the experience then becomes an issue because a scientist or an engineer may have one of these experiences and say, well, it's a coincidence. It happened, but it was a coincidence or it, it's a glitch somehow it doesn't have any meaning to it. Uh, that is what we initially thought, but we also took belief measures in, in our survey to see what role experience has in shaping belief. And there's a very strong positive correlation, as you would imagine. And if somebody experiences something, even if they're thinking it might be a coincidence, their degree of belief increases that this might be real. So that tells us that at least, and this was done within the United States, at least within the United States, that among academic scientists and engineers, the vast majority of people both believe and have had experiences of this type. At the same time, you cannot study this in the academic world. The taboo is still extremely strong. So we're, we're faced with one of many paradoxes about the supposed notion of academic freedom or at least in this case, you don't have, you're not free to study these things. In the US today, there are two universities, two uh, residential universities that are accredited where one can go and find at least a couple of faculty members who are interested in this topic and maybe doing something about it. I know of um, two, maybe three other universities and colleges where there are faculty who are teaching occasional courses, usually in the context of, of critical thinking skills, uh, which touch on these topics. And that's it. So we're talking about the possibility of thousands of institutions of higher learning and a handful that are actually looking at this. And that's crazy given that 90% of the population is interested. Yeah. Do you, yeah, it's it's crazy the amount of skepticism you must be facing with this. And I, I can really see with the book how much you've had to dedicate to just trying to convince people that this is real by giving them study after study after study. Um, in, in your uh, study of this field, have you found many interesting theories about the evol evolutionary basis, uh, the reasoning behind some of these abilities that people can develop and that is so that are so commonly experienced well that actually is the reason why i wrote real magic because if you if you come from a scientific worldview which is which most most educated people come from today within that worldview it is exceedingly difficult to figure out why psychic phenomena can exist because the only reason why these phenomena are considered strange is because they're not constrained by the, the usual limitations of space and time. That's, that's why it's considered weird. It is also the, exactly the same reason, which is why quantum mechanics is considered weird. That the phenomena are not locked in space time, at least conventional space time. So whenever uh, we are faced with something that seems to violate common sense, many people are going to be very skeptical about it uh, to the point where many will not accept any data at all because, I mean, there are people who believe we didn't go to the moon because they didn't personally go there. And people who believe in all kinds of strange things that, that are objectively probably not real 
because they they can't wrap their mind uh, from a conventional perspective into something which is not common sense to them. In fact, if we didn't have telescopes and microscopes and the other instruments of modern science, we would be living in the Middle Ages because the common the, the, what we learn from extending our senses is radically different than what we what common sense says. So I don't spend too much time worrying about uh, skeptics other than when skeptics intervene in the ability to do this kind of research. And there are some who actively try to prevent research from taking place. And they're very vocal about it and, and emotional about it, uh, which tells me among other things that they're not thinking rationally when it comes to these topics. It's not very scientific of them, is it? No, it, I mean, at least some, some skeptics will, will admit that it's okay for somebody to study this as long as it doesn't use any public funds and as long as it is, doesn't rise to the level of anybody actually believing in it, which is kind of funny. <laughs> so I think when you, you take a long view, you look at the historical view of, uh, of, of why there's resistance, to especially to magical and psychic phenomena and the mix of it, is that there, there's at least a thousand, maybe 2000 years of pressure from the religious side that you shouldn't study this stuff. It's either black magic or it's heretical or just don't look at it. Yeah, it's the devil. <laughs> it's the devil. Uh, and then the, the other side comes from science. So there, there are two major ways of knowing the world. There's the religious side, the scientific side. Both of them are saying in different ways, don't look at this. Which for some people like myself are, are thinking, oh, why are there so many people saying don't look at this? There's probably something interesting to look at. <laughs> That's how punk rock of you. <laughs> it, for me, it's a matter of curiosity, right? I mean, the curiosity is is provoked by having people say, no, that's impossible. Don't, don't look there. Uh, and I'm not that unusual as far as scientists go. A lot of scientists are drawn into the profession from curiosity. You learn very quickly, especially if you're in the academic world, that you have to keep your curiosity at bay because there, there's certain areas that you, you should look at and others that you shouldn't. And there are also differences in different countries. So in the UK, it's okay to be considered eccentric as an academic. In fact, it's sort of expected that, ex that academics are eccentric eggheads. And so they're, it's okay for them to do that. In the US, it is absolutely not acceptable to be eccentric. You, you have to fall in line in a certain way and express certain beliefs and so on. Uh, even though it creates a schizophrenic state in many people because they have all kinds of interesting interests, but they can't bring it into work. And other countries are uh, flipped the other way. For example, in India, the idea of psychic phenomena is very broadly accepted, and yet hardly any academics are studying it. And so when I was in India for a while and giving lectures on this, I, I asked the head of a department of uh, cognitive neuroscience at the University of Allahabad, which is one of the places I gave a talk. I gave a talk on uh, the evidence for telepathy and said uh, they were all very interested, the senior faculty and junior faculty and students asking lots of good questions. And I, so I asked the department head later, uh, well, do you think you'd like to study these things? The answer was immediately no, which surprised me given they have all the right tools to do it. And I said, well, well, why not? I mean, he had a, a statue of Ganesha on his desk and religious icons everywhere. And it was completely believing that this is a real phenomenon. And his answer was that telepathy doesn't fit within the, the academic discipline of cognitive neuroscience. It's simply not something that is allowed to be done within the discipline. Even though it was, there was no question that the phenomena were real, which, made, which, which hurt my brain trying to think about this, because obviously from a cognitive neuroscience perspective, the idea of telepathy is, is quite a radical break. You think it would be interesting. Yes, yeah. And yet they feel the same constraint, which is so strange. So culturally it's okay, except academically it's not. And the academic system around the world is always the same. It's based on a Western model where the scientific worldview does not admit that this is possible, except for maybe quantum mechanics. So. 
coming out of that tradition, I, of course, was wondering, well, where do I look for clues? There are a lot of, of my own colleagues who have been developing theories for many years to, to try to shoehorn the, the nature of the data that we see into acceptable models. And none of them work very well, which is why from a mainstream science perspective, people are not persuaded. You know, they'll look at the data and say, well, how do you explain that? And our answer is we don't exactly know. And that's not, that's not gonna convince anybody. So knowing about the esoteric traditions, I decided to take a deeper dive into that history to see if I could find clues within that tradition that might help explain what's going on. And so the, the subtitle of the book is the, uh, the Secret Power of the Universe. And occasionally somebody will read the book and write a disappointed review saying, I didn't ever talked about the secret power of the universe, which <laughs> I'm thinking, have you not actually read the book? Because obviously the secret power of the universe is consciousness. That's the basis of the esoteric traditions. Uh, it's a very different worldview. In fact, it's completely opposite worldview than materialism, which is the scientific worldview. But from that tradition, the esoteric traditions, all of them are talking about consciousness as a fundamental, the fundamental in the universe. And from that arises physics and then from that arises biology and so on. So using that tradition, I mean, the, the esoteric ideas are as old as human history, maybe 50,000 years of recorded history. Uh, and science is roughly 300 to 400 years old. And so we have several thousand years of experience leading to ideas and a couple hundred years leading to a different kind of ideas. So clearly science works. It gives us the technology to do this, this interview in this way, which is astonishing. And yet it doesn't explain everything. And so the main thing that science has a very strong problem with is the nature of consciousness itself where it comes from, what it can do, why it exists. All of those questions are outside of the domain of science right now. What we do see are neural correlates of consciousness, brain-oriented states that are associated with different states of consciousness, but that doesn't tell us at all where it comes from in the first place. So if you do take the esoteric tradition seriously, and by the way, most of those traditions, in fact, all of them really come out of mystical experiences. It's the experiences that give rise to this notion that consciousness is fundamental. You do find clues as to why both magical practices and psychic phenomena must be true, because within those traditions, it, it's obviously true. Uh, but you also find a way uh, to make the case that the future of science, the leading edge of science now, try to understand the nature of reality itself, becomes more and more compatible with the esoteric ideas and, and not compatible with current science. So that's, this tells me that we're on a convergence course, that at some point, some of the ideas from esotericism and some of the ideas from present science will converge into something which is a mixture of both. And at that stage, it won't be seen as superstitious nonsense because we'll understand it well enough to start having practical applications of it. So we're not there yet. We, we could be somewhere between uh, two weeks and 200 years before that convergence happens. But I think the historical evidence is very clear that that's where we're heading. Yeah, it's been really exciting to see the resurgence of um, psychedelic research, among other things, in the last few years, because yep. obviously it's, it's related as well. And uh, the the practical applications that are leading it, I think, are, are really good to see. Um, the uh, trauma therapy that is emerging from the new psychedelic research, um, as well as all the research on meditation that is happening. Um, I was uh, looking at the studies that they did of Buddhist monks um, in researching non-dual states of consciousness. And of course, they can only measure the external correlates. You know, they can put a person into an MRI and see how their brain activity is different from a regular person who doesn't have, you know, 20, 30 years of meditation under their belt. And they can see real differences. So it's it's very exciting to see that they can actually... Uh, measure 
what enlightenment looks like in an MRI, even if it's just external, they obviously can't really see what is happening inside the person's head and and outside of their head as well. Um, but I, I think it's definitely uh, very promising to see these uh, studies being accepted and being done in in a more public way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and notice that for an entire generation, or almost two generations, it was essentially illegal to use psychedelics for any kind of research. So we we are what what this tells me is that there probably have always been there's always social pressure which uh, either accelerates or dampens interest in given topics. Psychic phenomena is one, psychedelics is another. Any form of altered consciousness state is is always been suspect by people in government because you can't control that very well unless you make it illegal. Well, of course, that doesn't stop personal exploration, but it does stop academic uh, studies. So taboos, even long-standing taboos can be broken. So we, we now see that uh, marijuana is legal in the US and Canada and uh, many other countries. Uh, same-sex marriage is becoming legal everywhere. So these, even 10 years ago, would have been were so taboo that the idea that these would now suddenly be legal would have been considered laughable. So the same is happening now with, uh, as you said, the rise of, of interest in therapeutics and for other reasons uh, for psychedelics. Eventually, the same thing will happen for a more open discussion of psychic phenomena. Because what, I think what we're seeing now is a resurrection of the psychedelic 60s and 70s. It was simply a cultural time that allowed it to happen. And some, much of the time, these interests pop up when there's pressure to make it happen. So in the 60s and 70s, the Vietnam War in the United States was tearing the country apart. And there was pressure from a growing number of people, mostly young people, who said this, is, has, this has to stop. So the, and also there was a large number of younger people because of the baby boom after the Second World War. So I think now we're uh, the worldwide we're seeing more of a pressure from not just younger people, but everyone who's paying attention to the state of the world, where we're getting a collective sense that we had better do something different because otherwise we're, we're not going to have a future. So this may be an evolutionary pressure to open a a whole bunch of doors and break a whole bunch of taboos that have held us back. And and I hope that is the case because we we knew we do need to think in different ways. Otherwise, we're we're sunk. It seems that um, some of these taboos have to do with upholding current paradigms and power structures. And I know that to many that might sound like conspiracy theory stuff, but historically, uh, like you document in your book, uh, the suppression of magic practices uh, was mostly done by the church because the church figured that if people were doing this kind of stuff and realizing that they could potentially affect the fabric of reality with their own thought and they didn't need an intermediary like a priest, then the church couldn't have control over people. Right. And no, I, it, it, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, m- many taboos uh, are social control issues. Uh, and, and who is creating the taboo it differs. But it's also correct that the status quo never wants to give up power. Ever, ever. Anybody in power in, in any form never wants to give it up. And that also sustains some taboos. And in fact, it even... There's enough disinformation that is projected by people in the status quo to keep people confused about what's real and what's not real and what should be studied and what should not be studied and so on. So you're right. It's A lot of it is about social control. I'd like to maybe uh, switch gears a bit and, and talk about some of the phenomenon themselves and, and get an idea of... of what is most interesting to you? What has kind of raised the most eyebrows? What is most promising as something that, um, you know, could be useful and integrated into uh, society? Well, those are all very different questions. <laughs> okay, so let's start off with what are some of the different psi phenomenon that you've studied? Uh, I've studied everything that can be studied in the laboratory context. 
So that, that includes uh, conscious and unconscious forms of precognition and remote viewing and telepathy and uh, psychokinetic effects ranging from cell cultures to human physiology and behavior and everything in between. Uh, and and the, the survival of consciousness side, mediumship and channeling uh, and even haunting uh, cases. I, I used to do uh, the occasional haunting investigation and I, I gave that up after a while when I realized that the yield in, of information, of interesting information in, the, in those cases was a ratio of about a thousand hours spent for each hour of something interesting. Oh, wow. And so when I was younger, I, I, most young people, you feel that you have an infinite amount of lifetime. Uh, and so spending a thousand hours didn't seem like it was, it was worth it. Now I'm a little bit older and I'm thinking, do I really want to spend 999 hours doing nothing, which is what happens in these cases? And the answer is no, I don't want to do that. So that's the, that's a younger person's sport, I think. Uh, but so the laboratory for me has, has always been much more interesting because you don't need to wait around for something interesting to happen. You're evoking it essentially in the laboratory. Uh, I can't say that I'm blasé about the phenomena because I'm still very interested in understanding how they work and making it practical and, and larger effects. Uh, but because I've, I've spent so much time working with the various phenomena that it, it doesn't it doesn't have the same uh, amazement pull that it had when I originally started because you see it often enough, it's not a big deal anymore. Uh, occasionally we'll do an experiment that does have a wildly strong res result. And that of course gets us all very excited. Sometimes it's real, sometimes it's an artifact. Of course, it's disappointing to find an artifact, but occasionally it's also real. So then that, that's exciting. And so a lot, of, a lot of the effort now is besides the, the basic science where we're trying to figure out uh, not only uh, that something exists, but the processes under which that tell us how it exists. Why does it exist? What are the variables underneath it? Uh, we're also now working more on uh, practical applications. So one of the programs I'm working on now is uh, which I actually started many years ago, maybe 30 years ago already, to make the equivalent of a psychic switch, a technology of intention, where through intention you could cause a, a switch to be thrown psychokinetically. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little bit more interested in that now than I have been in the past couple of years because some effects that we're seeing now are becoming more predictable and more robust. So it's a little bit like, like as an analogy, for many years, we were Benjamin Franklin working with sparks of electricity, and we got a kind of a sense of how to, how to generate it and a little bit about understanding it. But Franklin, like for many things he was interested in, was at least a century ahead of his time. He, he could see the sparks, he knew it was real, had some ideas about how to make it happen, which is what we do with psychic phenomena. We know it's real, we could study it, but we don't really, we don't know how to capture it yet in a way to, to turn it into a, a gigawatt factory of electricity. And it took, it took 100 years and it took thousands of experiments and it took geniuses like Maxwell and others to figure out in enough detail how electricity works so that we could use it. So we're we're at the beginning stages now, more more like uh, Faraday, perhaps, of figuring out ways of creating what we might call psychic batteries, ways of not necessarily storing the phenomena, which is mostly human centric, but uh, figuring out ways of amplifying it to the point where it can start to become practically useful. So that's that's one of my major interests right now. And is this the different exercises that people can do, or is it technology, or both? It's both. So the, all of these phenomena are, are psychophysical. It's the space in between physics and psyche. So part of the puzzle is how to get people in the right states. 
uh, we find again and again that you could spend a huge amount of time trying to train people or teach them to meditate or do something. And that's very inefficient. So generally, it's much more efficient to test a whole bunch of people without any, any pre-training or anything. Just say, do, do this task. The task might be to look at a computer and there's a graph showing a line being drawn on it. And your task is make that line go up mentally. You don't even need to know what it's connected to, but that's your task. Just do it. So some people have no problem with that. They say, okay, and they start thinking hard to make the line move up. And some people can do that. Those are the people that we want to work with because they're, they're not limited by trying to figure it out or whatever. They're, they just simply have a talent for, for manifesting, essentially. So that is a much more efficient way of proceeding with this kind of a, of a task. And what it says is that uh, unlike a light switch, which in principle, everybody could throw, this is a kind of technology which will require certain expertise to, to operate. So it's not going to be something sold in, in every, every street store because not everybody can use it, at least not with our current understanding. And I think probably never. There will always be some people who can't do this for one reason or, no, or another. Uh, so that puts it more into the category of something like a jet aircraft. Not everybody can fly a jet aircraft because they, they don't have the skills to do it. And lots of other jobs are like that too. Not everybody can be a computer programmer because they can't figure it out. So it'll be something like that. A technology that's for specialized technology for special reasons. We don't need to make a psychic garage door opener because we already have things that do that very reliably. Instead, we are looking at technologies that cannot be done by ordinary means. So we're talking about instant communication at very far distances, like a telegraph to Mars, perhaps. Uh, we're looking at uh, uh, the telephone from tomorrow. In other words, uh, uh, communication methods that transcend time. But, so those, these two applications, we don't have any conventional way of doing them, and yet both would be very valuable. Uh, and then there are others. There's a possibility of, for example, um, certain kinds of uh, modern materials require combining things into alloys. Certain metals have to be combined with organics and so on. There's lots of, like, like within in my iPhone, the, the kinds of, of material in this thing are extremely exotic, uh, and they're difficult to make. Well, there's some evidence that some catalytic processes can be accelerated, even just a small percentage, but accelerated so that you can make these alloys faster and cheaper uh, with, with less energy. Well, that even a 1% change in terms of the efficiency of some of these processes turns into billions and billions of dollars saved. The same can be said for certain pharmaceuticals can be made more efficient through intention, it's like taking the placebo effect and adding something on to that uh, that is no longer part of the individual, but has been put on by somebody else, like an imprint that makes it more efficient. So all of these little uh, improvements in efficiency in terms of manufacturing all kinds of things uh, turns into a very large savings. And this is important, not simply because it makes the companies more profitable, but it, it offers a possibility of producing less, less toxic uh, consequences of producing materials, which is another reason why we're killing ourselves. Like I just read the story the other day about the, the toxicity of this thing, that the, this is now accounting for a large percentage of, of global warming problems because of the difficulty in finding the materials and mining them and the amount of energy used to create it and so on to say nothing of what happens when you put this in a, in a land dump somewhere. It's toxic. So we, we're interested in finding ways, not just us, but a lot of people are interested in finding ways of helping us create a sustainable globe where we still have these kinds of toys, uh, but we're not killing ourselves at the same time. That sounds like real alchemy. It is very much a kind of an alchemy, yes. It is exactly putting back into chemistry what the alchemists knew. The alchemists knew that consciousness was part of the process, 
but that was left out of chemistry. And basically we're saying that we're putting it back in because it's useful. Yeah, another example that you mentioned quite a bit in your book is uh, blessing food by experiments where uh, experienced meditators would bless food or drinks and then people would consume that food and then uh, in double blind uh, studies, you would measure the effects that the food would have on their mood, controlling against people's natural uh, mood state, and that this, the results that you got were quite significant. So uh, that's that could be another application. Yeah, I've been uh, thinking of uh, how do we do an experiment on a very large scale to look at the role of intention? Because I, I know a lot of chefs, and when I talk to people who are cooks and chefs and ask them about the role of their own emotions and intention in terms of the way that people respond to the food, almost all of them say it makes a big difference. They're happy and, and the whole kitchen is happy. People have a better eating experience than if people of the kitchen's not very happy at the time. So wow. I thought, okay, let's go to McDonald's and, and suggest an experiment. So the experiment will be that uh, all of the staff in a given McDonald's, where of course the, uh, the profit is very well understood in these fast food chains because they keep track of it all the time. So we'll go to a McDonald's, we'll teach everybody to meditate, we'll do everything we can to keep uh, everyone happy in who's working there. And then we'll have a couple of control McDonald's where we don't do anything, we just keep them the way they were and then see how the profit changes. Will people, will the customers respond better to the environment and the food itself if it's coming from a happy McDonald's and if it's coming from one that is like a normal McDonald's? And so we can predict based on the few experiments that we did that there will be some quality difference in the food. It's all completely regulated. So the food itself is not going to change. But if people's moods and emotions are somehow being absorbed by the food itself where people can feel that, then they're going to have a better experience and we would predict that they'd end up buying more or more people would go there. So, so far, McDonald's doesn't seem to be interested in this idea. Um, <laughs> but there, there are other fast food places where that, that might be, and I haven't given up hope that eventually somebody will try that experiment. Imagine the training manual for implementing that. <laughs> yes. First, we, in the, we, you must meditate 15 minutes before every shift. Uh, the thing is so that because the meditation studies, and especially in the schools, like inner city schools, have such a dramatic effect oh, in yeah. terms of everybody, not just the students, but the, even the neighborhood changes, uh, that it, there's a, it's not too much of a speculation that a change of that sort, which would require some training, of course, uh, and some support by management and everybody else, but it, it, there's a reason to believe that that would actually change the nature of, of the food experience in, in a way that is completely pragmatic and crass, meaning that there would be more profit, but at the same time, it actually might be healthier. So we don't know that it would be healthier at this point. It might simply be that people's moods are changed, uh, but I think there's reason to believe, as I also report in the book, that besides doing studies about changes in mood, we also did studies on plant growth with, with water that was blessed and saw a huge difference. That means that there's some, something in the water that was causing an actual physical change in the plants. That in, in turn suggests that there's some aspect of food that has changed, even though it may be very difficult to figure out exactly what it is, but something changed. So that suggests that, yeah, that, that the Happy McDonald's with the real Happy Meal, not just the name, but an actual Happy Meal will make you happy because it actually is better for you. In fact, that's the approach I should take. Yeah, it's the real Happy Meal. There's your marketing <laughs> campaign. Yes, <laughs> just like real magic. We're talking about real happy, not just uh, the, the veneer of happy because you use that word. Yeah, it's like anecdotally, a lot of people know that when you make something with love, it's it changes the experience of consuming that thing. Yeah. Yeah. On both yeah. sides, the creator and the person who is is taking it. Yeah. Yeah. What are some of the other practical uh, applications that you see of this kind of stuff? Well, the big one is precognition. 
because we, we can see precognition in conscious responses, but primarily the strong and most repeatable effects are unconscious. So one, again, very crass application that we, we've seen uh, reported not as precognition, but it almost certainly is that, is in the futures trading market. So future traders uh, very quickly self-select as to whether or not they can do it or not. Because when you're, you're trading futures and commodities, it's like tossing a coin. You're, they're almost completely random because they're trading very quickly. Uh, and, and even the baseline is designed in such a way that there's no obvious way that you can tell which direction the future is gonna go, future market. So there's a study that was done, uh, I believe in, in London and a London-based uh, trading's teaching program where people would come in that wanna learn how to be traders. And uh, one of the things that they uh, asked the, each individual was to measure their interoception, and it, which is talking about the ability to detect your own heartbeat and also the feelings in your viscera. And, and the way to, to test this is you, you take an EKG and you ask somebody to press a button every time that they feel their heartbeat. And if there's a strong correlation between your actual heart beating and your perception of it, then you have strong interoception. So they separated people according to those who could feel the heartbeat and those who could not. And there's, there's a spectrum because people are also fall somewhere in the middle that they kind of vaguely feel it. And what they found was that the, the students who had a much better sense of their, their internals uh, did much better in terms of the profit that they were making in futures trading. And this was also true on the floor when they're actually trading, not just practicing it, but real traders that have high interoception do much better in terms of profit. The ones who don't generally will stop that as a profession because they, they're not doing very well. What this tells us is that because we see in not just precognition experiments, but almost any kind of psychic experiment, that if we're measuring physiology, that we're looking at the unconscious part of the mind, it's much more robust in terms of the effect that we actually end up seeing in experiments. That tells us that as we long suspected that these phenomena are bubbling up from the unconscious. But the more you are aware of that, and by any means, whether you're an advanced meditator who are, is, becomes consciously aware of more of the unconscious or somebody who simply can feel what their body's trying to tell, tell you through your heartbeat or skin conductance or whatever, you, those people are much better at tasks which require some kind of intuitive or psychic hit. So the, the pragmatics of this is that if you, you have people in any kind of position where they have to make a decision, uh, if you train them, even through biofeedback, to pay better attention to what's going on inside their body as a clue to what's going on, their performance is very likely to improve. So we have that as one of our many studies on paper at this point, which we actually haven't done yet. Uh, but this study is very simple. You, you find out first from a baseline how good people are in terms of, of detecting their own viscera, whatever system that happens to be. Then you do biofeedback to train them, probably on heart rate, uh, so that when they sit down and they're quiet, they can feel their heart rate very, very clearly. They can feel it. And then you train them, or you test them on various kinds of psychic tasks for you, which will require that they can feel what's going on. So the presentiment experiment is an example where you sit somebody down in front of a computer screen and you're measuring their physiology and sometimes there's an emotional picture and sometimes a calm picture. And uh, we can see physiological differences before the two different kinds of emotions, uh, even in people who don't even know that it's a psychic task. In fact, it's better if they don't know it's a psychic task. You simply can see that heart rate and other physiological parameters change before emotional pictures. Uh, anywhere between one second to about 10 seconds in advance, depending on the physiology that you're measuring. But now if you, if you take people who have been specifically trained for high interoception, will they do better on that task? 
my guess is, yeah, they'll do a lot better on that task because now there's a feedback loop between psyche, between conscious and unconscious, which gives a person a clue as to what's coming up and their response then will be much stronger. Of course, there's a lot of applications of this kind of stuff in the medical sciences too. Um, one of the books that we also very much enjoy is One Mind by Larry Dossie, and he's a doctor and uh, talked about his own experiences with the medical profession and with uh, the role that intuition plays and how um, it seems to be, in practice at least, an accepted thing that a lot of the time people who work in, especially in emergency rooms, they just tend to know what's going to happen to patients and they intuitively know um, they can diagnose, for example, conditions without doing any medical tests a lot of the time. And uh, yeah, I think that the applications for for healing and for diagnosis could be really significant, especially for diseases that we don't fully understand yet. Yeah, that's accepted primarily within the nursing domain. Uh, doctors are, are taught generally not to pay too much attention to their intuition, except in cases where the intuition is thought of as forgotten expertise. Of course, that is a form of intuition as well. So if you, an example I'd like to use is a firefighter who looks at a burning house and they have to make a snap decision as to whether they should run in there to try to save somebody or not. And oftentimes they're correct. And it's because through lots of experience, they, they learn that the state of the house is about to collapse or not collapse. And they don't, they're making such a fast decision that it's not conscious. They could just glance at it and immediately know. So that's not psychic, that's experience. But we have done other experiments that have to be psychic where, uh, for example, the one where we have mediums looking at photographs of people and the people are either alive or dead. Of course, the photograph is while they were alive, so there's no clue in the picture, but mediums often will say that, that a very fast glance at a photograph will tell them all kinds of information. And the simplest one to get is the person alive or dead. So we did that experiment and the mediums are correct. They're, they're not 100% correct, but statistically speaking, they can tell through a glance of, of a second or less. So the, the same thing is also true among some people who are medical diagnosticians who just at a glance of somebody can get all kinds of information that can be useful. So you're right. The, the pragmatics for talented people, right? I mean, the, one of the problems with the, the whole psychic domain is everybody wants to be psychic and a magician. Not everybody can do it for the same reason that we all can't go out and become sports stars or musical stars. You need a certain level of talent plus a huge amount of practice to, to be able to do it. And we like to live in a society now where everybody is equal. Sorry, everyone is not equal. And a lot of the training to develop these kinds of skills is extremely boring. As a longtime meditator, I can say that it's extremely boring. You just sit on your ass and do nothing for years and years and years and years until things start happening. Yes. <laughs> On the other hand, there are people who have a talent for meditation. So they can start meditating and within a week, they're having all kinds of strange experiences to the, even to the point where they may stop meditating because it's, it's uncomfortable. Like they're, they're getting thrown into some domain that they don't know what it's about. But on average, you're right. On average, it takes months before you notice a significant change and sometimes years before you start bumping into the uh, the special yogic powers that come out of the, the long-term practice. This, yeah. of course, now, now in the realm where uh, we want everything instantaneously, there's lots of new methods that are being used to see if you can jumpstart the average person into the equivalent of years of meditation in a matter of weeks or even days. So I'll give one example. So uh, transcranial ultrasound is, is now the, the hot thing. It used to be a tr a transcranial DC stimulation and other forms of electrical stimulation, uh, and which is still being used. But transcranial ultrasound has the advantage in that it's not electrical, it's purely sonic. It, it's a, basically the same kind of tool that you'd use to look at a fetus in, in a pregnant woman. And 
it's very safe. It's been tested up to enormously to, to, in, uh, in animal models to make sure that you're not harming a fetus, for example, when you use the ultrasound. And transcranial ultrasound is a little bit different because rather than having the, the, the flat sensor, which is used for most sonograms, it's a focused sensor, it's like a parabola. And what it can do is with multiple transmitters, you can focus down to a point deep inside the brain. You can get right to the center of the brain with this, this thing that looks like, a, like a, um, an antenna almost, but it's curved so that it can send sound deep inside. It doesn't harm the tissue at all, but at the point where all this, the sound is collecting, you can stimulate those portions of the brain. Wow. So a friend of mine is, uh, not a friend yet, I suppose, but a colleague uh, in Silicon Valley is one of the pioneers in this, uh, making these deep brain stimulation techniques. And he's interested in meditation and psychedelic states and so on. And was working with a, a famous uh, meditation teacher called uh, Shinsen Young. Yeah. So Shinsen was interested in uh, being a long-term meditator, can achieve the state that he calls empty mind. So this, this is a place where meditators try to get to. Some can never get there. It's where you, you completely turn off mind wandering and there's, there's nothing left other than awareness. It's probably close to what a magician would call gnosis and close to samadhi as a yogi was tried to achieve. So he can get there and he knows what it, what it feels like to get there. So use of a transcranial ultrasound focusing on a particular portion of the brain causes that to happen. You, you zap it and within seconds, mind wandering is gone. Wow. The wow. so-called default network of the brain that, that is related to mind wandering is just gone. So this is a way of jumpstarting 30 years of meditation practice. We don't have any idea whether it's safe, right? I mean, it, this is, we know that it's true, at least in Shinseng, because he knows what it feels like. And a normal person, we don't know yet. Is it safe to push somebody 30 years ahead of where they are? Is it okay for the brain? Probably it's okay for the brain. It's not damaging anything, but we don't know the consequences yet. So we're at the very earliest stages of developing new technologies, which would eventually look something like a helmet or a small helmet that you would wear, where you could pinpoint locations in the brain to cause different mental states because of the close correlation between brain states and consciousness. At least not consciousness itself, but at least your perception of what's happening. Wow. Oh, yeah. Actually, uh, Shinzan, yeah, I'm, I'm just starting to become familiar, familiar with this work. Uh, uh, this is really interesting. But I, I suspect that uh, doing this kind of thing to people has uh, some ethical implications because just anecdotally, uh, having talked to people who've had a, a spiritual awakening where they um, you know, sort of the first time that they got into this no no mind state and were able to maintain it, uh, it seems to trigger uh, a rapid change in in the brain, which can last a couple of years until it settles. So to do something like that, just to kind of force somebody into that state can be very disruptive to their uh, daily existence. But yes, it's yeah. to be said for psychedelics. Right, yes. psychedelics will blast you whether you want it or not into pretty exotic states, and in most cases, if people can live in an ashram with no other responsibilities, that's fine. But most of us can't do that. In which case, you don't want to dramatically change somebody too quickly because then, then they become dependent on that state, uh, or more, more importantly, they can't work. They can't do their work. Yes. So that's not very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, again, comes back to the idea that it's not for necessarily for everyone. And in our egalitarian society, we love to think that, you know, anyone can do anything they want. But realistically, it's more of a question of, first of all, do you have a proclivity for something? And then secondly, are you willing to dedicate the time and the difficulties that come with you know, mastering these skills and the consequences and the brain change that comes with it and all of that. I think at a, at a low level or an elementary level that ideas like affirmations 
they're they're all they're pretty positive and would probably work for most people, maybe even everyone. Just the idea of positive thinking makes a difference. That if you adjust attitudes, that it makes a difference. They're not in that anywhere near magical properties at this point, but just from a, a way of being, if you if you approach that in a more positive way your whole experience suddenly becomes more positive and affirmations are generally in that direction. So it, I think it, I don't want to give the impression that some people cannot do this. Everyone can do something. The degree to which it works really is the, the underlying issue. Some, be, some people are, are very, very talented and can achieve all kinds of interesting things very quickly. Others might need 30 to 40 years. And it's true. Not everybody has the discipline to be able to do that. If uh, someone has, you know, a, a bit of a, uh, has noticed a bit of a talent uh, for these kind of side phenomenon, do you have any recommendations for books or practices uh, that they could look into? Uh, well, of there's course you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, Real Magic is is actually a, a book that is less about magic and more about the philosophy of science. And, and I didn't want to use those terms because nobody would ever pick up the book. It, it is about magic, but you can only understand magic once you understand the context that, of science and the context of history and all the rest of it. So I sort of put everything together in one book. But a friend of mine has written a book uh, that I was actually thinking of writing as a follow-up to real magic. I'm thinking, still thinking of writing a book called Practical Magic, which would be, what, what do you do? So I'll give him I'll, I'll give him a, a blurb here. This book, oh, Miracle cool. Club. So this is by by Mitch Horowitz. This just came out. Uh, it's a uh, Mitch is an expert on uh, new thought, basically, and um, and uh, occult ideas that have turned into mainstream ideas, part of the affirmations genre. So the Miracle Club is uh, the subtitle is How Thoughts Become Reality. And it basically is, is an, an instruction book at a pretty elementary level, but it says if you wanted to do elementary forms of magic, this is what you would do. Kind of as I, I give one chapter giving some elementary ideas about writing magic and sigil magic in, in my book, but this is now an entire book talking about stories of where people use these kinds of things effectively and then exercises you can do yourself. So. Now I don't need to write a book on practical magic because I'll just tell people to go buy Mitch's book. So what uh, what, what have you been working on lately? What's most exciting to you now? Uh, I have uh, four experiments on uh, various kinds of mind-matter interaction. Uh, one of them involves entangled photons. So I'm using entangled photons because uh, we're, we have the, the working hypothesis that mind is non-local. That's why psychic stuff is strange. And entangled photons are strange because they're also non-local. In fact, it's the, the primary form of matter that we can work with that is a non-local phenomenon. So uh, we're basically seeing whether the non-locality of mind and the non-locality of matter are a better match as targets in, in a psychokinetic experiment by using entangled photons. And the task is to manipulate the uh, strength of entanglement between the photons. Uh, this experiment would have been virtually impossible to do 10 years ago because it was so expensive to create entangled photons. But now you can buy a machine that fits on your desktop, which produces about a thousand entangled photons per second and, and very high quality, meaning that you can show to extreme levels of confidence that these are actually quantum entangled and not classically correlated. So the machine push generates the photons and we give feedback to people about the entanglement strength. And your task is, uh, sometimes people know this and sometimes they don't, but the task always is make the little line in the graph go up. If that's happening, then the entanglement strength is increasing. So our pilot studies show that uh, people can do that. They can modulate the entanglement strength. We have no idea in the world how that's possible, but it's happening nevertheless. 
So it gives us maybe a clue that there, there is some relationship between non-local mind and non-local matter. So that's one, one experiment. The and second where is this uh, experiment taking place? Actually, I had this online for about three months, uh, but then now we're doing it in the lab. So it's, it's, I mean, it's a literally a desktop device that produces it and you just need a computer to monitor the, the output. Uh, so that's one experiment. The second experiment, uh, I'm, I'm along the same lines. I'm interested in unusual targets uh, because there's, you think about in the domain of mind matter interaction research, what have we actually looked at in terms of the matter side? And the answer is almost nothing. We've looked at tossing of dice. We've looked at things like electronic random number generators. Occasionally we use bacteria and cell cultures and so on, but the range of possible things to look at as compared to what we actually have looked at, it just scratched the surface. So entangled photons is a new domain. The next thing I'm looking at is plasma as a target because plasma is not solid, liquid, or gas. It's something, it's a fourth state of matter. So it's yet another state that we, we think is exquisitely sensitive to magnetic and electromagnetic fields. All plasma is very sensitive to that. So if somebody, uh, one thing you could do is you could use something like a squid detector, a superconducting interference device. You know, these are very, very sensitive magnetic uh, sensors as a target, except they're really expensive. You need liquid nitrogen and you need special equipment. We don't, why we don't have one. So we can't use that. I'd like to use it, but we don't have it. So what you go for is an, an indirect way of looking at almost the same sensitivity, which is plasma streams. So what we're using is a plasma ball. You know, these, these like an eight inch diameter glass ball that has plasma streams in it. It's used like a, for a, a decoration, but they also turn out to be extremely sensitive to basically everything. I mean, especially magnetic fields and, uh, and electromagnetic fields. They're really, really sensitive. And that's what makes the ball interesting because of the dynamic nature of the streams themselves. They're always kind of flitting all over the place. So we're using that as a target, uh, a mental target, and with results so far that are really interesting. Um, what's the third one? Oh, the third one is uh, we're developing a next generation version of a double slit system. So we've done lots of experiments with op optical systems like that. This one is designed to be uh, much more sensitive in terms of detecting that there's a mental effect on the, the so-called collapse of the wave function. And then and that's, that's still kind of on the expensive side. That'll end up costing probably $15,000 worth of stuff to make it happen. Whereas a plasma ball costs $40 <laughs> and a, plus a webcam. Right, so this is a cheap experiment, but it looks like it's working. And then uh, the next one is I'm making a, what I think will be about a hundred dollar version of a double slit experiment. Because to, to, to make the double slits, uh, to, to do it properly in the physics way is expensive. Uh, the low end is maybe 10,000, you can make, get away with it, but uh, some of our prototypes have cost $30,000. Well, that means, that nobody else can replicate it except people in physics labs and they don't wanna do this sort of thing. So I'm trying to, to make one that costs about a hundred dollars that will, that will be sufficient to, to do the task. And this involves using a diffraction grating rather than a double slit. So a double slit is two, two little slits, obviously. A diffraction grating is 10,000 slits per inch. You know, you know, if you look through a diffraction grating up at the sky, you see pretty colors because it separates white light into the different colors. The diffraction grating, if you send a laser through a diffraction grating, unlike a double slit where you get the, the interference pattern, you get a, a dot in the center and two dots on either side. And it's it, because of the geometry of the diffraction grating, all of the interference patterns collect into a single dot. So you have a dot in the center, which is the particle-like aspect, and two dots on either side, which is the wave-like aspect. So 
This means you don't need a highly complicated way of detecting the result. You simply need a photo detector at one dot and a photo detector at the other dot and look at the ratio of light between the two. So that's something I've built a prototype which maybe cost $60. Uh, it's not quite sensitive enough for what I want, so I'm going to make another version of it and see if I can refine it to the point where for about $100 to get a little box that has all of the apparatus in it, you plug it into your computer, and then you have an experiment. So that could be something, uh, this is essentially not only for replication, but if people want to experiment with the effect of their mind on photons, well, this $100 box, you can do that. So that those oh, are the, very cool. the four experiments that are underway. Wow. Are you planning to publish the the plans and ingredients of these experiments so that people can try them at home? Oh yeah. Yeah, everything gets published. Uh the for the the fraction box, uh I suppose we could publish the the, the like um, a recipe on how to build it, uh, but we might want to build it ourselves and sell them. Right. I mean, we can give the instructions too, because anybody who's going to do it as an experiment needs to know exactly what's inside the box. Uh, but it's very straightforward. I mean, it's such a simple idea that uh, something like uh, use a, a microcontroller that has, do you know about the company called Adafruit? No. So the, uh, there's lots of uh, nice little microcontrollers that cost about $30 or so. One's called Arduino. Uh, so you take the Arduino and you program it, and uh, it already has voltage regulators and all kinds of stuff that computers have in it. It's very sophisticated in terms of what it can do. So you just set it up with sensors that you can buy from this company called Adafruit, uh, which are extremely sensitive light detectors. And you need two of them for this experiment. And you can buy a laser diode that costs a dollar, which is sufficient. And so that's all you need, a laser, two sensors, and an Arduino. So altogether, that's roughly, that's about $50. And then uh, uh, you plug it into USB in your computer, and we'd have to provide a program to receive the information. Uh, but in principle, it should be extremely simple. That, that's why I, I, I'm interested in that, because I, I want others to be able to replicate this. Anything that we do in the laboratory, I find interesting, of course, but the currency in science is replication. So we, we have to find ways of, of getting other people to try the same experiment cheaply. Mm -hmm. That's, That's so cool. <laughs> super exciting. Decentralizing the science. If you can get, you know, thousands of people around the world to do this. That's the idea. Yeah. And the same goes with the plasma globe. The plasma globe, it costs about $40. A webcam costs another 20 or so. That, along with the proper software, would allow people to do that as an experiment too. So, so I'm, I'm interested, and this is similar to what Rupert Sheldrake has really specialized in, where you, you find very simple ideas that people can just try. Oftentimes, they're not quite as, as, uh, as rigorously controlled as we can do in the laboratory, and not, usually not as sensitive either. Uh, but it democratizes what's going on here. And we know that people constantly say, well, can you test me in the laboratory? Well, usually the answer is no, we don't like to test individuals in the lab. We like to go out and find people that we want to work with, especially if we're doing studies on mediumship or studies on channeling. So I'm involved in those in a peripheral way because my uh, colleagues are doing studies on that. At uh, the Institute where I work, I used to be the one scientist who did most of the work, and now we have seven of us. So we have a multidisciplinary team looking at all kinds of uh, different uh, phenomena in the psychic domain, uh, and we we work with each other. So that's that's better for everyone because you have other minds thinking about, well, is this designed correctly, and could that be a mistake, and so on. This would be one of the most fascinating vlogs to watch in the world. If you just video logged and published uh, your findings in the lab, I think that would be super interesting. Well, we, we always try to publish everything we do in the lab. What we have not done so much, but what we should do is to take photos and videos yes. of the experiments as they're underway. 
Yeah. So with, with this now in hand, this makes it a lot easier to do that. Uh, and I, I don't know why. And I mean, we we have taken some videos in the past, but they generally don't go anywhere because we don't know what to do with it. <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll show it occasionally a clip uh, when I'm doing a presentation. But it's true that we we haven't systematically uploaded it to a blog, where where it should probably should be for mm -hmm. historical purposes to show what what are we actually doing? Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, if you just stick it on YouTube and put a put a simple explanation, and then maybe write up a blog post on Medium or somewhere like that, uh, just explaining what you were doing, I'm sure lots of people would be interested and they would share it. I know that you know Ken Wilber, among other people, has put up some stuff on YouTube and documented some of his experiments with, um, you know, trying to control his own brain waves. Oh yeah, the one he did where he meditated with the EEG machine and just sort of showed the different waves he can produce at will. Yeah. Um, I think they had a couple hundred thousand or uh, up to a million views on that, and he didn't do anything with it. It's very amateur video, just no descriptions, no standard practices, just uploaded and yeah, people shared it. Yeah. So uh, the IONS, where I work, uh, is having a new, a new website, which will uh, start in January, and it will al allow at least a blog. So it's true, I, it, even within a blog, I could put a link or maybe embed uh, videos, and that, that probably is something we should systematically do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. I think what you guys are doing is fascinating and more people need to hear about it. And this is, I mean, going in the medium that people consume the most content is definitely the way to go. So, you know, YouTube, Instagram, mm -hmm. Reddit, those sort of places, uh, that's where the most eyeballs will be. Mm -hmm. Is funding an issue in, in this industry? Is it hard to get funding for these kind of studies? Yes. Yeah. I mean, if funding were available, you wouldn't find a handful of, of places doing this. Uh, I, I can guarantee that if uh, if the federal funding sources and, and uh, large foundations are giving millions of dollars to do this stuff, you would find in scientists everywhere doing it. It's, so the, the part of the limitation is a taboo, but the taboo is related to the, the available funding. Mm -hmm. So we have a development department that, that does nothing other than raise funds all the time. And we spend probably a quarter of our time writing grants. Wow. I wonder if the private sector and cryptocurrency markets is a is a way to go uh, for more funding. I know there's a lot of philanthropists and and people with very very deep pockets in the cryptocurrency industries. And that's where most of our sponsors end up being for our podcast. And you know what you mentioned with uh, traders being interested in this kind Ooh, of stuff. Wow. If that's how you could frame it, you could probably get some interest. Yeah. Yeah. We we talk to a lot of entrepreneurs from lots of different domains. They usually want results now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they are yeah. always asking about what's the return on investment. Well, yeah, yeah. We, we don't know yet. It you know they're doing basic science here about something that was mostly unknown, uh, and and so they generally will lose interest pretty quickly because mm -hmm. we can't say what the ROI is, and we we're not ready to launch a product yet. Yeah, right. We've even had to, with discussions with patent lawyers about some of the things that we've been doing, saying, well, this, you know, these are ideas that have intellectual property that maybe should be protected. Uh, most of the time they recommend that we don't patent it because it's too far away from launching as a product, in which case uh, you, you will have all of the expenses of doing the patent. And then at some point when it does become viable, you'll have people stealing it anyway and be spending even more money protecting the patent. <laughs> so apparently, um, and we know lots of people in Silicon Valley who do this all the time. The patents are useful once you have a robust um, department, like a legal department, and enough money to be able to support it. But before that, you just go with proprietary information. Mm -hmm. You just don't tell anybody how you do it. Well, that's antithetical to science. Right. Science is you say everything. So we're in a funny spot here where if we end up with something like a technology that will really work, Maybe we can't publish it, at least until it's protected in some way. So I don't know. I, I don't think we're that close to it yet, but uh, someday somebody will be. Uh, Dean, this has been probably one of the most fascinating interviews we've done. Um, and it's so cool to have someone so open minded and so based in science um, working on these things. So uh, thank you for joining us. 
It's my pleasure. All right, guys, that's it for this episode. If you want all the links, mentions, anything else we talked about in this episode, go to futurethinkers.org slash 65. See you in the next episode. Thanks for tuning in to Future Thinkers. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell icon to get notified of new videos. You can also follow us on social media to stay connected. If you'd like to get a t-shirt like the new Make America Think Again, go to futurethinkers.org slash store. If you like what we do and you want to help us make more podcasts and videos, become a patron or visit our sponsor Qualia and use the coupon code FUTURE to get 10% off your purchase. See you in the next episode!